Hey everyone, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host Sherry and you are listening to From the Dark Side. Today we have a man named Patrick Mullins who was 52 years old. He was well loved by many people, a genuine good guy. He disappeared while out on his boat one sunny afternoon and nine days later his body would be found. Today, it's 11 years later, and his family is still looking for answers. This is truly a mysterious one. My sources are listed in the description area. This is episode 108, The Case of Patrick Mullins. This story takes place in 2013. Edward Snowden became internationally famous for leaking classified NSA wiretapping information. Water-bearing minerals were found on Mars by the Curiosity rover. Twerk and Selfie were added to the dictionary. Microsoft announced the release of Xbox One. Actor Paul Walker died in a car crash. And lastly, gas was $3.33 a gallon, which isn't much different than today in 2024. On January 27, 2013, Jill Mullins is spending the day visiting her sister out of town. Her husband, Patrick, is at home and restoring some boat motors in their backyard. Their home is next to the Braden River in Manatee County, Florida. This river is a tributary of the larger Manatee River. It flows into the Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Patrick loves to work on boat motors. Their backyard is right next to the Braden River, so Patrick could test the boat motors right there. It was super convenient. According to reporter Lee Williams for the Herald Tribune, Patrick even talked about once he has retired, opening a boat motor repair shop with his brother. Patrick loves the water and is an avid fisherman. Today, Patrick is going to take out his 14-foot boat called a stump knocker. He needs to test out this boat motor he's been working on. His family says Patrick always stays in the Braden River and doesn't venture out further into the Manatee River and certainly not the Tampa Bay and Gulf of Mexico. The stump knocker is made for shallow water only. Patrick Mullins and his wife Jill have been married since 1983. They were in the process of planning a big celebration for their 30th wedding anniversary. Patrick worked as a fourth grade teacher for over 20 years. Jill was a teacher as well. They decided to get their master's degrees later in life, and they both became librarians. Patrick was the librarian at the local high school and was well-loved by all the students. Some say he changed their lives. He always, always was available to talk or give helpful advice. His students all say that Mr. Mullins truly cared about them. Sometimes he would even leave the school library open until 6 or 7 p.m. so the students had a safe, quiet place to complete their homework or if they wanted to study for a test. He also helped pay for students' SAT tests whose families were not financially able to do so. He also paid for students' college entrance exams. That's a really awesome thing for him to do. Patrick and Jill have two sons who are grown and moved out, so they were enjoying life in their early 50s, and their adult children had their own lives now. Their son, Mason, is 26 years old and is in the Army, and at the time of this story, he's deployed in Afghanistan. Their 24-year-old son, Miles, lives in Tampa, and he's a student who goes to the University of South Florida, where he is earning his degree in civil engineering. Both are good men, and they say growing up living next to the water with an awesome dad who was always working on boats was a great experience, and they both had amazing childhoods. Miles says his dad is very straightforward. He always does things by the book. He always wore a tie to work, and on weekends he was known to restore boat motors. When he was working outside on a boat and needed to run to the parts store, he would wash up and even clean the grease out from underneath his fingernails in case he ran into one of his students. He was a true perfectionist. Patrick sets out on the stump knocker on January 27, 2013 at 3 o'clock p.m. He's got to test this restored motor out. Jill returns from visiting her sister where she had been for most of the day. It's between 6.30 and 7 p.m., And once Jill is home, she realizes that Patrick isn't there. However, his truck is still there. 
She still had no idea what his plans were for the day. She had left in the morning, and they discussed that later that day when she comes home, he would help her gather some household items she was planning to give to one of her coworkers. She looks around the yard and doesn't see any sign of him anywhere. She checks with the neighbors, and he's not over at their house. She tries to call his cell phone and doesn't get an answer. He had left his cell phone in his truck, which is in the driveway. Patrick was known to be one of those guys who never has his phone on him when he's home, and my husband is the exact same way. Once he's home, that cell phone goes on the charger, and he doesn't pick it up again until he leaves. My cell phone is within arm's reach at all times. So it's not out of the ordinary for Patrick's cell phone to be in his truck. He really doesn't care about the phone. Jill goes out to the edge of their backyard and sees that the stump knocker is missing, so she knows he must have left on it. However, evening is settling in, and Sunday evenings in their house are when they wind down and get ready for the upcoming work week. He's never out this late on the boat. Boating while dark isn't something he likes to do. Jill calls her son Miles, who lives in Florida. Her other son Mason is in Afghanistan, and there's not much he's going to be able to do. Miles tells her not to worry about it. He tells her his dad was planning on taking the boat out to test a motor. He'll probably be back very soon. However, by 11 p.m., Jill calls Miles back and says he's still not home. Miles now knows something is very wrong and makes his way over to their house. Jill also called Patrick's brother, Bert, who was local, and asked him to get in his boat with Miles and you guys go look for him. Bert and Miles met at the boat ramp, and they're off on the dark river to look for Patrick, but they don't see any sign of him or his boat anywhere. They have flashlights, and they're checking all the nooks and crannies of the river. Meanwhile, Jill has contacted the Manatee County Sheriff's Office. She says her husband left earlier that day on his boat, and he hasn't returned. He's a very experienced, safe boater and wouldn't be out this late. The sheriff's office begins a search in the river while deputies also interview Jill. They begin asking her questions that are common for missing persons cases. Did you guys have a big fight? Were there any financial difficulties you were facing? Are either of you having an affair? Jill is like, no, I've been away at my, all day at my sister's house. He went out on his boat like he does every Sunday. He never goes far, just the local river. However, Everyone is aware that this small river leads to a bigger river and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. The search team checks some local boat bars. I didn't know these things existed, but I'm intrigued. Basically, you pull up on your boat and there's a bar there. Patrick did not go to bars anyway, and he wasn't at any of them when they checked. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and also the Coast Guard are now assisting with the search. Jill says there were helicopters hovering over her house all night. A neighbor of Patrick says he saw him cutting his grass around 2 p.m. that afternoon. Then around 3 o'clock p.m., he saw Patrick get on the boat and set out on the river. Everyone is thinking perhaps Patrick's boat capsized and he is injured and on shore somewhere. Patrick had a life vest and was really responsible, so this is a best-case scenario. If something were wrong mechanically with the boat, Patrick could have fixed it or fixed it enough to limp it home. As the hours pass by and the Monday morning sun comes out, the more grim the situation is looking. By now, his boat could have drifted a long ways. According to Unsolved Mysteries fandom, the search for Pat included helicopters, search and rescue vessels, 18 surface units, and a C-130 aircraft equipped with advanced night vision technology. They covered miles of water. Just two days after Patrick set out on the water, his boat was located. It was found unmanned and floating in the Egmont Channel, about seven miles northwest of Egmont Key in the Gulf of Mexico. Large container ships use this channel all the time. It would have taken Patrick about two or three hours to reach that location. There is no reason for his small stump knocker boat to be out there, and Patrick certainly wouldn't have never come out this far. This was supposed to be a quick trip. He's just testing a motor. That's it. All he needs is the Braden River, not the Manatee River, not the Tampa Bay, and certainly not the Gulf of Mexico. The boat's engine was turned to the idle position, but it was out of gas. His hat, his sunglasses, and life jacket were in there. 
There were no signs of foul play, no blood, no forensic evidence. So this is promising. However, the sheriff's department initially believes that he may have had a medical episode of some kind and fallen overboard. They're still searching islands around looking to see if maybe he had swam to one of them. The boat was quickly returned to Patrick's family once it had been processed for evidence. Miles noticed that there were streaks of red paint along the side towards the bottom that had not been there before, almost like something had hit it. Have you ever hit something with your car and the paint comes off of the other object and onto your car? That's basically what Miles is seeing. They don't think too much of it at the time, but these red paint streaks will be more significant later. Meanwhile, Mason, who is away in Afghanistan, gets word that his dad is missing and the army is making arrangements to send him home so he can assist with the search. A few days pass since Patrick's boat was found, and the family is now hoping that if he doesn't turn up alive, please just let us find his body. The not knowing what happened to him is killing them. Nine days after Patrick disappeared, this is February 5th, 2013. A charter boat is in the southern area of Tampa Bay, which is right at the Manatee River. The Manatee River is absolutely beautiful. I've heard of this place well before learning of this story. Basically, it's a shallow river. It's only a few feet deep. You can see the bottom from the surface, and there are big manatees that swim around. The captain of this charter boat is a man named Jeffrey Page, and he has this loudspeaker and is speaking to the tourists on the boat. Here we see a cluster of manatees to the left and so on. He does this tour all the time. Someone yells out, Captain, what's in the water over there? Jeffrey looks and sees something in the water that's not a sea creature or even supposed to be out there. He spots the body of what appears to be a man floating in the water face down. The water is crystal clear and only four feet deep. This is miles away from Patrick's house next to the Braden River. But he immediately feels like this is likely the missing boater, Patrick Mullins. Everyone is talking about and has been on the news. He says the man had a rope tied around him. It was like an intric intricately wrapped rope around his waist, and it looked very odd. He sees the man is wearing jeans and a shirt and a watch. He is missing a shoe on one of his feet. His head appears badly damaged. The captain pushes his emergency man overboard button. The police make their way out there on boats. Surprisingly, it took them 40 minutes to get there. They check the pants on this body and find his wallet is in his back pocket. The ID says that his name is Patrick Mullins. This would later be confirmed through his fingerprints. Patrick has been found. He was 52 years old. There was a three-quarter inch rope wrapped around Patrick's left shoulder twice, and then it went down in between his legs and around his waist seven times and was then tied off across his chest. On the other end of the rope was a 25-pound anchor that was supposed to be in Patrick's boat. The anchor is on the bottom of the river, and Patrick is attached to the other end and floating. According to the Herald Tribune, the sheriff tells reporters at the scene that this appears to be a suicide. He would later deny making this statement. They bring the body to shore, and it will be transferred to the medical examiner's office. Patrick had moderate decomposition, but he has all this head trauma. The medical examiner determined that this was from a shotgun. It had entered one side of his face and exited out the other side, leaving several holes from the buckshot. However, he could not rule out that he had been shot more than once. The medical examiner listed the cause of death as undetermined. Manatee County Sheriff's Department believes that this was a suicide. They feel he wrapped himself up in this rope. The reason they believe he did it to himself is because his hands were free and the rope was tied in the front. They believe he attached the anchor to the other end. He sat on the edge of the boat, used the shotgun to shoot himself in the head, and went overboard. This is why they say there wasn't any blood or any evidence in the boat. It all went into the water. 
But Patrick's family believes this isn't what happened at all. They believe this was a homicide, and I don't feel like they are being delusional. No family wants to believe their family member committed suicide. They aren't just saying, no, he was happy, he wouldn't do that. They have real signs that this could be a a homicide, which we'll get into. Jill seems to be a fair person, and I feel like if she thought this was a suicide, she wouldn't be kicking and screaming, demanding answers the way she is. Patrick's death rocked the community, and people are devastated. Their beloved librarian, who was a fourth grade teacher for over 20 years, is gone. He taught so many students and is remembered well. No one can believe this is a suicide, and people have questions. Let's go over again quickly what was found. The boat was found unmanned with the engine set to idle and it's out of gas. All of his boat stuff was still on it except his anchor. There is absolutely zero evidence of blood on the boat. His family notices red paint on the side of the boat, which they say was not there before. Patrick is the ultimate perfectionist. He would have cleaned it off. Patrick was found one week later with all of his clothes still on except he's missing one shoe. He's tied up with a rope around his waist, but his hands and arms are completely free. He's got a shotgun blast to the head. It started below his right ear and exited above the left ear. The medical examiner determined that this was not a contact shot. So when you place a gun against your skin, it will leave markings after the shot, almost like a tattoo. He didn't have those. So the gun was not touching him when it was fired. Patrick's family says he did not appear suicidal. He had a great life and was looking forward to retiring next year and would have collected $150,000 upon his retirement. He was excited to someday have grandchildren that he could take out on the water in his boat. He talked about it often. He was looking forward to his 30th anniversary party in just a couple months. Now, Jill told Unsolved Mysteries that the week before he disappeared, Patrick did seem a little off due to stress headaches. This does not mean he committed suicide. I had an awful last week. If I died mysteriously, some would say, well, Sherry did appear stressed out last week and she seemed annoyed most of the time. It's a bad week. People have them. I'm also not saying I'm 100% certain that Patrick didn't commit suicide. But a bad week and a mysterious death don't always mean it was a suicide. I feel it's lazy to immediately classify someone's death as a suicide. Most investigators will tell you that a death investigation should always be looked at as a possible homicide until it can be ruled out. They did check his phone records and found nothing out of the ordinary. Patrick didn't really use his cell phone anyway. Before Patrick set out on the water that day, he stopped by a local farm store. He purchased a few items and saw a pair of welding goggles, and the price was marked down. He mentioned he was going to buy them, not because he needed them, but because that was a great price and he would use them eventually. So he's not passing up on this deal. This shows Patrick had plans to use them sometime. If he planned on committing suicide, he's not worried about saving money on welding goggles he's never going to use. Patrick didn't own a shotgun, or any gun for that matter. He wasn't a gun kind of guy. Jill says he never showed any interest in guns. A forensic audit was done on his bank account, and there was no evidence that he purchased a gun recently. He also didn't have any recent cash withdrawals, so he didn't purchase one in cash. Police checked with gun shops in the area, and no one sold him a gun recently. They also checked with friends and family, and no one had loaned him a gun. As well, a shotgun was never located. I struggle with why he would use a shotgun in the first place. There are much smaller handguns that could be used to and have the same outcome. Why buy this big, bulky gun? I also struggle with the fact that the boat's engine was still on. Wouldn't he have shut it off so he could sit in silence for a few moments before taking his life? As well, there was zero blood in the boat. Not a single speck of it landed in in the boat. A shotgun blast is going to produce a lot of bodily fluid, maybe not just blood, but brain matter and other bodily fluids. The medical examiner could not rule out that Patrick had been shot more than once. If he was shot twice, there was no way possible that this would have been a suicide. 
Patrick had no health issues, no financial issues. He had no history of drug or alcohol use. He lived a quiet life. He was a librarian who enjoyed working on boats in his free time. The police believe he tied himself up, sat on the edge of his boat, placed the barrel of the shotgun near his face but not touching it, and then fired. He may have staged it to look like a homicide since his life insurance policy he had through the school district had a no-suicide clause in it. If it was determined to be a suicide, his family wouldn't get any life insurance money. Jill believes that Patrick met foul play while out on his quick trip. There is a man named Damon who is a friend of Patrick's brother. Damon and Patrick were not friends. They were acquaintances at best. Damon owned a French restaurant and was the chef there since 1999. People say he's a great guy. In the days and weeks after Patrick's death, Damon began acting strange. He's displaying this odd behavior that has Patrick's family wondering if perhaps he could know something about Patrick's death that he's not speaking of. So again, he and Patrick were not close whatsoever. They just knew each other. Of course, everyone is very sad at this time. Patrick was a beloved member of their community. But Damon seemed to be taking it really hard. His grief was disproportionate to his relationship with Patrick, which was small talk when they see each other at best. He told Jill sometimes he just goes to the Manatee River and stares at it for for hours crying over Patrick. He would also break down and begin crying uncontrollably when someone mentioned Patrick. A few months after Patrick's death, there was a Memorial Day gathering, and Patrick's family is there, and Damon is there. He brought his dog with him. He ties a rope to his dog, and the other end of the rope he wrapped around his waist. The knot and wrapping fashion look very similar to how Patrick was found. People wondered if this was some kind of sick joke. People are like, what is wrong with you? Another coincidence is that Damon owned a boat and the sides had red paint. They mention this to the Manatee County Sheriff's Department and they ask Damon if they can take a sample of the paint for comparison, but he declined. They also didn't have enough evidence to get a search warrant for it. Acting sketchy as hell doesn't mean he's guilty of murder, but Damon was sure being strange, including trying to sink his boat multiple times. Damon developed a meth problem after Patrick's death. However, we don't know if this problem was there all along and it's just being revealed. It's possible that Damon was using drugs around the time of Patrick's death, which would explain his odd behavior, such as uncontrollable crying and breaking down any time anyone mentioned Patrick. According to one of Damon's friends, he said, Damon was a likable, dependable, admirable guy, but after Patrick's disappearance, his behavior quickly became different. Now, if you want to go super conspiracy theory here, like many users on Reddit have, I'll give you one theory that's been mentioned, and I am not saying this is true, so don't come at me. This hasn't been reported on any reputable news source that I can find. It's widely known that Damon is a gay man, even though he had a wife previously. Some are convinced that Damon was having a secret affair with Patrick, hence the reason he was so emotional about his death. The other theory involving Damon is that he may have killed Patrick. He lived close by, he had a boat, but I struggle with this because I don't see any reason for why he would want his friend's brother to die. He wasn't going to benefit from Patrick being dead. It did nothing for him. It wasn't a robbery since Patrick was found to have money in his wallet and all of his belongings were on the boat. Damon had no criminal history and up until Patrick's death was doing good in life. One year after Patrick's death, he lost his house to foreclosure and also his job, which could be because of his drug addiction. Damon passed away in April 2017. He was addicted to drugs after Patrick's death and died of an overdose. Damon's daughter did allow his boat to be analyzed. The red paint was indeed a match. However, this brand and shade of red paint was very common on boats, so it may not have come from Damon's boat at all. 
Some believe that Patrick stumbled upon something he shouldn't have, such as a drug deal out on the water. It could have been between Damon and someone else. The under the other individual shot Patrick and Damon just witnessed it, and that he, is why he is overcome with guilt and sadness. He couldn't tell anyone what had happened. But I truly feel like if Patrick stumbled upon a drug deal going down, he's probably going to mind his own business. He's not going to pull up beside them on his boat and say, hey, I caught you criminals dealing drugs. I'm turning you in. No one would do that except for maybe law enforcement. Jill says Patrick was always wanting to help others. If he saw a boat in distress or having mechanical issues, he would certainly have pulled up and offered his help. Is it possible he encountered some bad folks? I can't talk about this case without mentioning lead investigator Detective Davis of the Manatee County Sheriff's Office. Jill was once his English teacher, so they knew each other and he knows Patrick as well, since he went to the school that Patrick taught at. Keep that in mind. One day after Patrick goes missing, Detective Davis contacts CSX Railroad because there is a railroad bridge right over the Manatee River. He asked for their surveillance footage since there's a camera there. This could be huge. It could show if Patrick's boat is empty or if there's two people on it. It could show other boats that were in the area as well for potential suspects. CSX responds back in an email that they that he needed to specify which date he was looking for. They also said in not so many words to make it snappy because the camera footage recycles itself every two and a half weeks. They were able to send him the footage from the time he requested, but the file was corrupted. Nothing came out of this. No footage has ever been viewed of the time Patrick may have crossed under the bridge. I would have aggressively requested the footage be resent and not corrupted. Two and a half weeks passed and the footage was written over with new surveillance. According to the Herald Tribune, Detective Davis allegedly called Jill upset and asked her why she took her concerns to the media and that she should accept her husband died of suicide. Detective Davis denies making the statement by saying, I think it would be very condescending to her. I wouldn't make that statement to her. That conversation never happened. Me and her do have a relationship. She was my English teacher. Jill says that Detective Davis had more of an interest in helping her with grief than with investigating this as a homicide. He wrote in an email to her the following, quote, It is my most sincere prayer and desire that God will provide you comfort in the midst of what you're going through. No one knows how you are feeling except you and God. I know it has been very hard for you and your family during this ordeal. I only wanted to provide the best answers that I could during the course of this investigation. I know we will forever be tied together in life. You were very instrumental in my growth as a young man, and I am indeed grateful that God placed you in my life. My petition slash prayer is that you will be given that understanding and acceptance going forward. Great occasions for serving God come seldom, but little ones surround us daily. Thank you for believing in me. Jill says that she was looking for confirmation that the sheriff's office was doing their job, not what God would be doing. She says Pat did not kill himself. We were about to celebrate our 30th anniversary. We have great kids. He was looking forward to being out on the river when he retired, and he had a wife that loved him. It seems to me like Detective Davis is basically just gently telling her to accept her husband committed suicide. We did our investigation. We don't feel any foul play is involved. If we did, we'd investigate this as a homicide. Dave Bristow of the Sheriff's Department said, when we go into these investigations, we're not hoping one thing or another. It doesn't matter to us if it's just a suicide, a murder, or an accidental death. We just go where the evidence takes us. I really don't know which way I'm leaning. Patrick doesn't seem like the kind of guy to take his life. Is it possible that he wasn't completely transparent with his life to his family? He seemed like he had a great life. Plus, he made purchases right before he left on the boat. He was set to retire in just one year, and he talked about opening a boat repair shop with his brother. Some say it's impossible to hold this long shotgun and shoot himself with the barrel not touching his face. He would need super long arms to be able to do that because of how long the barrel is. He was missing a shoe, though, and it's possible he could have used his toe to pull the trigger, 
That theory reminds me of Kurt Cobain. Many speculate that Kurt Cobain had to use his toe to pull the trigger. The fact that not a single shred of DNA evidence was found in the boat makes me wonder how he could have pulled this off. Shotgun blasts are very messy, and I don't want to sound insensitive here, but there are brains found all over the place. If you're inside a room, they're going to be on the walls and the floor. If you're outside, brain matter has been found in trees. It's a very messy way to die. The boat was given back to the family after being looked through. I wonder if the investigators got out their Q-tips and bagged them and so on. We know that luminol was used to check for blood and there was none found. Patrick didn't even own a gun, nor did he have any interest in them. Police think one reason this is a suicide is because his arms and his hands were free. However, if he was already dead when he was wrapped up in the rope, the person wouldn't care that his arms and hands are free. All they care about is making sure this rope isn't going to come off and securing this anchor to him. I also find it odd that the rest of his body was in good condition. He had average decomposition, and that's it. No aquatic life had begun doing what aquatic life does to a dead human body. With a lot of blood in the water, it would certainly bring out predators. I mentioned earlier that perhaps he came across something he shouldn't have in the water. I believe Patrick would have minded his business and kept on going. As well, I feel like the odds of running into some major crime while out and about on a sunny afternoon are pretty slim. If he did come across a drug deal, the average run-of-the-mill drug dealer isn't going to want to murder you just for seeing what he's doing. He likely didn't run into Pablo Escobar out there. Although Bradenton, Florida Florida was once a hotspot for heroin, so much so that the DEA set up field offices out there. Many arrests took place and none were ever on a boat. Patrick is known to be helpful. If you look like you needed help, he would definitely go over and help you. Most people needing help would welcome a guy who knows what he's doing to fix your issue. I don't see anyone wanting to kill him just for offering help. I don't know why anyone would want this man dead. In 2020, Patrick's case was reclassified as a homicide. If Damon had anything to do with it, we will never know since he passed away. All this family is looking for is a proper investigation. I don't feel like they are asking because they refuse to believe that he would commit suicide. I feel like they missed their window for a proper investigation. It should have been from the beginning. Even if they got Damon's boat today and tested it with luminol, it's been sitting outside for over 10 years. I feel like any DNA evidence has been washed away as well. We know Damon tried to sink his boat multiple times. Patrick's family tried to get the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to take over the case, but nothing ever came out of it, at least that I can find. I feel like the Sheriff's Department immediately declared this case a suicide, which is what happened in the Joanne Matuk Romain case as well. I feel like they assumed suicide and they didn't want to go back and say we were wrong, so they spent the investigation tying the evidence to suicide. But I'm also not fully convinced that this was a homicide either. I truly don't know. It would seem out of character for Patrick to commit suicide because he had no red flags that would indicate he would ever do such a thing. If he staged it to look like a homicide so his family could collect his life insurance, it was super elaborate and a crazy way to do it. Plus, a gun was never recovered. Most people who are local to the case believe this was 100% a homicide, and the police lean towards suicide. I feel for his wife and his two sons. His sons now have kids of their own. Patrick talked about becoming a grandfather one day and wanting to take his grandkids out on his boat. I'm sure he would have been an amazing grandfather. I also feel for all of the students whose lives were touched by friendly Mr. Mullins. He was a great teacher and librarian. He funded students who couldn't pay for their college entrance exams. He paid for students who didn't graduate to get their GED. He was a mentor to so many, and his people truly loved and appreciated him. If you read his obituary online, you'll see it flooded with condolences from former students of his. They all agree he was stern and didn't tolerate any bad behavior and that he truly cared for each of them and wanted them to have the best education they could. I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Was this an elaborate suicide or do you feel Patrick was murdered? Do you also feel that Damon had any involvement in it? 
Rest in peace to Patrick Mullins. That's it for this week, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care, and much love to you all. Intro music is Feral Angel Waltz, which is composed by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All his music can be found on his website, incompetech.com.